Hello and welcome back. Today I want to talk about how sets of frequency dependent values can be used in multispice. For example, if you know the S parameter characterization of a component at multiple frequency points, like you do after measuring it with a network analyzer, how can you simulate the raw data? Well, if you're curious, then keep watching. Today, I will be talking about the FreeQ frequency function, which is a frequency-based lookup table that can be used in LTSpice. Unfortunately, this is not explained in the LTSpice help file, but we can still find information about it here and there, since it is part of the general SPICE language. Now, the function will allow you to use frequency-based complex values, and the numbers can be expressed in multiple ways. And since the function uses parameters based on discrete frequency values, this will only work in AC small signal type of simulations. So first off, I found two main ways in which you can use this function. It can either be used as part of a behavioral voltage or current source, where the output of the behavioral source will be the value from the frequency table multiplied by some sort of input, or it can be used in the definition of a resistor to define its admittance. So the resistor's impedance will be 1 divided by the value coming from the frequency table. So in this first example we have a very basic table with two points. So we are using three values to define a point. For the first point we have a frequency of 1 Hz, where we have 0 decibels and 0 degrees. And for the second point it's defined at 10 Hz, where we have 10 decibels and again 0 degrees. Same thing for the current source. And then in the case of the resistor, our second point is at minus 20 decibels because this gets inverted. So if we run the simulation to see what happens, first of all, looking at our behavioral sources, our input signal is flat at 0 dB. So that's because of the AC1 signal. And if we look at the output of our voltage source, we can see it goes from a value of 0 at 1 Hz. So the input value of 0 dB multiplied by 0 is still 0, and it goes up to 20 decibels at a frequency of 10 Hz. And in between we have a linear interpolation. And well, the phase stays at 0 degrees. In a similar fashion, if we now look at the current running through our resistor, we get the exact same thing. Current goes from 0 to 20 dB in a linear interpolation with 0 degrees. Now if we move on to our resistor, we can observe its impedance, which is the voltage present on it divided by the current, current being 1 in this case, the impedance will be equal to the voltage. So this again goes from 0 dB up to 20 dB. Now when talking about resistors and their impedance, we don't normally express it in decibels, so we can go to a linear plot, and we can see that the value will go from 1 ohm, so 1 volt divided by 1 ampere is 1 ohm, up to a value of 10 ohms. Now, the graph is curving because we are using a linear scale on our y-axis, but if we change our frequency axis to linear as well, then we again see our very nice linear interpolation. Now, the default values in which you express the points in the frequency function are decibels and degrees, and these are not always the most convenient. So let's now look at some other ways in which we can insert the values. So for that, I prepared a set of examples based around the initial voltage source that we started off with. So you have a set of five possible arguments that can be used in front of the frequency statement. You can express your complex number in polar form, either with a magnitude or decibel value, together with a phase expressed in either radians or degrees, or you can go for Cartesian form, and express the value as a real and imaginary pair. So starting off from a base example with the default settings, we have 0 decibels 45 degrees and 20 decibels 45 degrees. We can express this with magnitude if you don't like decibels. So in the second example, 0 decibels becomes a magnitude of 1, 20 decibels becomes a magnitude of 10. We can use multiple of these modifiers, so to have both magnitude and radians, so if we convert our 45 degrees, it's approximately 0.785 radians. 
or if we don't like this form of expression, we can go for the real and imaginary numbers, and then these sets of values get converted to the bottom side numbers. So all four of these examples should give the exact same result. So if we plot them out, so this is the first example, second one, third one, and fourth one. So the output magnitude is the same, the phase is only slightly different, and that's because of the approximations used in the various numbers. So 45 degrees in radians is pi divided by 4. So 0.785 is an approximation, so that's why the small differences are occurring. Now, so far I use tables with two points, which is not all that interesting. So how can we make larger tables, so use more sets of values, but also express them in a more easy to digest form, not just make a huge string of numbers. So for this example, I'm continuing with the behavioral voltage source, and now we are using three frequency points. So one hertz, five hertz, and 10 hertz. But it's already becoming quite difficult to work with this string of numbers. So if you need to change one value in this set, it's difficult to figure out which number is which. So first thing you can do is simply divide up this large parenthesis into three smaller parentheses. So each of these sets contains three values for the individual frequency points. This will make analyzing relatively small sets of points far more easy, but if you have something like 100 points all in a single line, then again it becomes quite a big issue. So the next best thing is to turn your behavioral source into a sub-circuit model and throw all the values in there. So for this example, I took the symbol from an E source, a voltage dependent voltage source. I changed the prefix to type X so that it accepts subcircuits, and then the subcircuit is defined right next to it. So we have four terminals terminal 1 and 2 are the output, and terminal 3 and 4 are the inputs. And we have inside of this subcircuit a single behavioral voltage source with the same definition as before. Now, what makes this better? is that this component description can be stored in an external library file where it can be easier to edit. And finally, to make it properly easy to visualize, we can split up the sets of values onto individual rows and use the plus symbol to concatenate them. So now we can add as many points as we want, row by row, and it will be far easier to read. So if we run this simulation, we can see that again all four versions have the exact same result. Now if we come back to our resistor example, the same approach can be performed, so you can either define the points in individual parentheses, or create sub-circuit models for the resistor. Now as before, for this to work, the resistor symbol needs to be edited, so if you right click on it while pressing the control key, the prefix needs to be changed to type X to accept sub-circuits. Here again, if we look at the results, we get the exact same thing for both methods. So that about covers the main ways in which you can implement the FreeQ function in LTSpice. So now let's look at an actual use case. In general, the utility of circuit simulators is that you can take real life components or circuits and model them inside of a computer. So let's try to do that extract the S11 parameters of a real-life component, and then throw it into the simulator. For this, I will be using the light VNA to measure a inductor. So this is a 1 millihenry inductor that I had in my component box for ages, and I don't really know much about it, I don't have a simulation model for it, because I do not have a order code for it. So to fix that, after the device was calibrated, we can see the impedance being displayed, so this is for reference mainly, but we can save it to have something to compare our data to, and at the same time we can also save the S1P file. So this will be a export of the S11 parameter of the measured device. Now back on the computer, we need to take our measurement values and process them a bit. So if we open our S1P file using a text editor like Notepad, we will see that the values are expressed as real and imaginary pairs, and that the frequency is expressed in hertz. So here we can see the sets of three values that we need for our frequency table, 
but the only problem is that they are not exactly in the format that we need them for LT Spies. So the easiest way that I found to edit this is using a spreadsheet program. So if we simply copy all of this, throw it into something like Excel, we need to edit it a bit, so to split it up into the three columns, and then just add the missing bits. So we need the parentheses before and after, and some commas in between. And we now need to concatenate all of these. So once this is done, we can copy all of the values into another text file in which we create our simulation model. So after all of the values, we will need a dot ends. And at the beginning, a small definition for the circuit that can make use of the S11 parameter. So this is the basic two resistor and one behavioral source circuit that we will need to process this data. Now, there probably is a more easier way to go from the measured values to the final model, but for me, this was the easiest method. But anyway, if we now go back to the circuit simulator, we can import our model, so using a dot lib statement, where we can use a resistor that uses sub-circuits, so because of the prefix x, and we can run the simulation and use our model. So I'm using a current source to inject a signal, and we can extract the impedance either by looking at the voltage present on the component or by using the dot net statement. So we are getting kilovolts, which are kilo ohms, and we can see a nice resonance frequency at around 2 point something megahertz, and we can also see the phase going from a value of plus 90 down to a value of minus 90. So we have the typical behavior of an inductor, inductive up until the resonance frequency, after which it becomes capacitive. So if we compare this to our initial measurement, well, on the measurement we are having a linear scale, so let's change that, maybe rescale things a bit, and if we put them one next to the other, we are getting extremely similar results. Basically, they are the same thing. So now we have a simulation model for our unknown component that we can use in various other circuits and experiments. So the FreeQ frequency function can have a lot of applications. Mainly, it will help you make use of large sets of network or similar frequency dependent parameters to describe the behavior of a component or a circuit in cases when using an actual simulation model is more complicated. And with that said, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be updated to all my videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.